Hey everybody. So, welcome to chapter 25. We'll be looking at, a lot of this chapter has been on Africa, Southwest Asia. Um, we're going to look at a new type of imperialism that develops. This is now post-colonialism. Colonialism from the 15th to really the 18th century and we get to the 19th century, which this is 1800s. We're really sort of post-colonialism. It's a different type of imperialism. It's global. And we'll also look at global economy a little bit and uh, just some, some things like that. Okay. So Africa from the slave trade to European colonial rule, trade and social change. Uh, slave trade uh, begins to decline into the 1800s. Um, we see it start to decline. England actually outlaws slavery and the slave trade around 1807. Um, other countries, though, take it up and do a lot of it, uh, continue on after England sort of bows out of it. We see Islam expanding into Africa. Um, by 1914, pretty much the entire continent of Africa, 80% of it, has been claimed by some European power. Uh, very little in Africa is technically independent and under their own self-governing. Trade and social change, 1775 to 1807. So before 1750, slavery was generally thought about as acceptable by most Europeans. They didn't see it. They didn't have to deal with it. There was very few slaves in Europe. Uh, you could live your whole life in Europe and never see a slave. But they were perfectly fine to live off of the profits of it. It's sort of uh, out of sight, out of mind. However, by 1775, the Enlightenment had, you know, had, been, had taken root. And uh, we see this revolutionary period we talked about in the previous chapter. Uh, morality towards this changed. Very directly, uh, slavery became not necessarily socially acceptable anymore. We start to see laws against it, protests against it, uh, again, rights of man. Even though most folks are very clear, these types of rights generally apply to white Christian European males. Uh, we do see some extension of these rights to women, non-Europeans. Um, and then even if we don't necessarily believe in any type of equality for Africans in this time period, still most think that slavery is barbaric. Uh, we do see these, these changes, and we do see a movement in England, and it does spread into other countries in Europe. We see women protesting. We see women having an integral part in this, protesting and pushing to end the slave, end the slave trade. And uh, the anti-slave movement, or abolitionism. Uh, abolishing something is general anything, but when we say abolitionism or abolitionists, we're generally referring to abolishing slavery or people who want to abolish slavery. Anti-slavery sentiment was also growing in the U.S. Uh, by the time of the Revolution, by the time of Jefferson, early 1800s, uh, there is some among the elite, especially in northern part of the colonies, that are really hesitant to want to have slaves. There's people who are already discussing, even though slavery doesn't end in America for the better part of a century, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who don't have any interest in slavery. They don't want slavery for a variety of reasons. Um, not always altruistic. Some people believe slavery was terrible because it competed with free market. It competed with free laborers. Uh, how can a laborer compete effectively against someone who doesn't even get paid? Um, so it wasn't always for the best reasons, but there was uh, moral reasons, religious reasons, people believing it was wrong to enslave people, and of course, simply economic reasons, that slavery was unfair to the normal laborer. So there's a variety of reasons uh, why people questioned it and challenged it, uh, even in the Americas. One solution, uh, because there was no actual governmental solution, there was no broad government solution. Someone came up with the idea of the ACS, the American Colonization Society. Um, and the purpose of this was uh, returning freed slaves to Africa. Uh, we'll free them. And this happened for some, only some, you know, several thousand. That's it. 
and there were probably this time period a million, million and a half at least. So um, a few thousand being returned wasn't really. But uh, they create this new territory in Africa called Liberia, and they end up deporting thousands of freed slaves there. Um, so we do see this on West Africa, close to the West African coast. Um, however, we do see the trade continue. Uh, each, England drops out, but Portugal picks it up. Spain is still doing it. We see other countries continue. Uh, and by the 18-teens, we see the slave trade actually ramp back up again. Not necessarily into the U.S. We don't see the slave trade really uh, coming into the U.S. much. Yes, there's still slaves coming, but not, not a significant number. The majority of slaves this time period are going to Central and South America. Um, uh, it isn't that slave owners in the states, in slave states, didn't want slaves, but they didn't need to buy them anymore. Natural reproduction had replaced uh, purchasing slaves from outside the country. Uh, so we do see this happening. We see lots of debates about this. We even see re revolts. We see uh, mutinies on ships for slaves in, a, I don't know, literally like two or three times. That's it. We're actually able to revolt and take over the ship. Um, we do see that happen. We see revolts in slave colonies in Central America. We do this happen. Of course, America, we have different slave revolts. We don't have any successful one. There's never a successful slave revolt. Uh, in the, in America, but we do have them a couple of times. You have them in Haiti, which Haiti is actually successful. The the revolt in Haiti, the slave revolt, is actually a successful revolt, although um, it gets pretty ugly. Uh, eventually, the colony is retaken, and the leaders of the slave revolt, who had won initially, are slaughtered. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, of course, it does eventually lead America to the American Civil War over the issue of slavery, or probably more directly over the issue of, of state rights. Uh, it was really what the Civil War was about, but of course, the state right that seemed to matter the most to the Southerners was, of course, the right to own slaves. Um, all right. So as trade does decline, we do start seeing other markets and other goods have to replace it. So uh, some, some countries, like England, for instance, really sort of pull away from the slave trade, which was so profitable for centuries. They have to find other goods to replace it uh, and replace the goods that are traded for slaves because the trade was really about the slaves selling the slaves for natural resources. So they have to find goods and things like this to uh, do this, to replace these exports with something legal, something profitable and legal, and something more socially and morally acceptable to a lot of folks. Uh, legitimate cargo, like like palm oil, for instance. Palm oil. Uh, sales began to replace this. Palm oil was used in soap and cosmetics, and if you've ever heard of uh, palm olive, uh, the detergent, it's based on, you know, it was probably originally used, made palm oil when it was made into it. Soap, cosmetics, um, yeah, makeup, things like this, even medicine. Even though there is zero medicinal properties, I, I believe. Um, lots of things, I know, cocaine was used as medicine for a long period of time. So, uh, yeah, they didn't really know what the hell they were doing. But nonetheless, um, let's see what else. However, as the Atlantic trade does decline, we see the trade actually increase. Uh, by you know early 18-teens, we see the re trade sort of replaced. It's redirected, though. In, uh, the trade which had come to the northern colonies and the central colonies of the Americas, we see now primarily directed to South America and some to Central America. But even in Central America, it's largely natural reproduction. Uh, plus, those are mostly little, little islands that can't, frankly, hold many people, slaves or, or not. Uh, so we see the trade uh, sort of redirect more towards Asia, towards India. Uh, internal slave trade in Africa becomes very, very, very big. Just in the early 1800s, the first half of the century, 18 to 1850, we think something close to 7 million slaves were pulled out of Africa and taken to India and Asia, China and India and Southeast Asia. Again, to be used on plantations, as servants, as domestics. I haven't necessarily used that term yet. You may hear more. Domestic replies to someone who's a servant. Cooking, cleaning, child care, whatever. Uh, it's usually a live-in person. Uh, now, domestic would not technically be a slave, uh, 
but often the Africans were used as domestic slaves um, in East Asian and uh, Central Asian society. Uh, and as I said, there's a strong internal slave trade as well, very strong internal slave trade. Um, as some entrepreneurial business people decide, well, it's not necessarily good to be shipping slaves anymore by the mid-1800s. So what they do is they actually set up their businesses with it, you know, because they've been shipping slaves to their plantations all around the world. So some entrepreneurial businessmen decide, well, we'll just set up the plantations in Africa. And we'll just buy the slaves there from one area, relocate them to another area, and work them on the plantations right there on the continent. And we see that happen to millions of Africans who are enslaved and simply transferred to another location in continent. Um, yeah. Um, type of goods, uh, peanut oil, for instance, bananas, peanut oil, things like that. And of course, you know, hundreds of other products. The gold trade is still big. The salt trade is still big. Um, animal products, animal skins, things like this. Um, Islamic revival and the expansion in Africa. For over a thousand years, Islamic, Islamic influences had crept across Africa. Uh, Northern Africa had primarily been Islamic religion and Islamic governing for, by this point in time, almost a thousand years. But it had been primarily restricted to that small strip of Northern Africa from the Sahara up, just the bottom, that's the top, like 10%, 15% of Africa basically from the Sahara, which has almost no population. There's a few people live out there, a few nomads, a few Berbers, but very, very small. And along the Black, uh, pardon me, the, uh, the Red Sea, the Red Sea, right? Yeah, the Red Sea, which is uh, basically what connects or separates, I guess, Africa from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Right there with the Sinai Peninsula up there at the top as well. But really, uh, even though Islamic influence had been in Africa for a thousand years, it really was restricted to just that northern section. We see in this time period with the extinction of all the, the expansion of all the trade routes into Central Africa, anywhere, all through history, uh, wherever the trade routes go, things filter through, whether it's technology, uh, science, religion, disease, uh, they would follow along with the trade routes. So we see this Islamic influence start to filter into Central and, and uh, Southern Africa, much more so than it really had, even though it had been there for the better part of a thousand years already. Um, we see African rulers, African cities, we see African merchants all start to convert over, and we see, our, see Islam have a very strong influence, uh, especially in Northern and Eastern Africa. Um, we see the populations, which had tra traditionally been like animist, animist, which was like I mentioned before, worshiping nature spirits, worshiping animal spirits, things like that. Um, different types of spirits and deities, all different, a whole pantheon of, of different things, but not what we think of as a traditional world religion, even though this is far more traditional if you look at it that way. The animism has existed for thousands of years. Um, most still uh, tend, especially in the rural areas, they tend to hold on to that. So the cities, the more elite, the upper classes, the merchants, the educated, most of them all convert over to Islam uh, in northern and central and eastern Africa. Uh, but the rural people uh, less educated, rural, um, more in the villages are usually still with their more animistic beliefs. We do see a lot of holy wars, these jihads, these Islamic holy wars, all through the 17 and 1800s, which, same thing the Christians had done, of course, for the better part of 2,000 years. Anywhere that there were unbelievers, they would go in and sort of forcibly convert them. Uh, it's conversion at gunpoint uh, had been sword point for, of course, well over a millennia. Now it was really gunpoint and forced these people in places and regions to convert over to Islam. Again, it's this jihad, that, which is given this term for Islam. Christians have been doing this all along as well. I don't uh, the closest thing you might say with Christianity is a crusade. 
Uh, but at the same time, Christians did it all the time. They didn't need massive wars of crusades. There was always this belief that the other people should convert over to ours because our belief is superior to their belief. Yeah, Christians believed it. Muslims believed it. Uh, doesn't mean every person did. Doesn't mean the general population wasn't out there trying to forcibly convert other people over. But the governments did. The military did. Um, religious leaders did. Uh, because anyone who didn't believe was a threat. A threat to the faith. Because if one person doesn't believe, then other people have to look and say, well, what's wrong? Why don't they believe? Why aren't they a follower? What's wrong? Because if our religious faith is so great, why wouldn't they want to follow it? it you know, it's the same, same type of argument, same type of story slash fear and argument uh, that's been made you know, all, all through uh, religious history. We have an example here, Usman Danfodio. He launched a jihad in 1804. He eventually overthrows the Hausa rulers. This would be sort of a central western Africa. Overthrows the Hausa leaders. He establishes a caliphate, uh, which is a caliphate, which is a, a, a Muslim uh, empire. Or, well, kingdom might be the best way, because it's small at this point. It's, it's small. So this Muslim kingdom, which we would was referred to as a caliphate, the Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, he brought educated elites. He brought in Islamic law. Um, it also solidified Africa in this area. Um, uh, it solidified slavery in this area um, because this was the largest slave trading empire in all of Africa and Southwest Asia. It's believed that just through this Sokoto Caliphate, trading between Central Africa and the Middle East that over the next century this uh, caliphate alone and you know I mean there's probably others who were involved were responsible for the trade of two to three million African slaves um, just under this Islamic rule from Central Africa into the Middle East. Um, and this also is where it changes. Uh, all types of people have been slaves in the Islamic Empire going all the way back to right after the time of Muhammad. Um, it was simply business. Again, you go back to that time period, it was just a standard thing. It's not excusing it, but it's also nothing special that Muslims were doing. Uh, slavery was a common thing in the ancient world. Um, uh, but the difference there was their slaves. If, if anything, you actually see like in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, there were probably more white people that were slaves in the Muslim empire than non-whites. Slavery wasn't about being black. It was just, it was mostly about wars of territorial conquest, um, usually, and then they would enslave the people, who anyone who resisted them. Uh, this changes in this time period. By the mid-1800s, the slave trade in Central and Northeastern Africa into the Middle East was almost exclusively black Africans. It was simply easily accessible. The slave trade had dwindled off from the white Europeans, and Muslim um, merchants moved in and simply took over uh, much of the slave trade in Central and Northern and Northeastern Africa. Becomes the second largest slave trade uh, established in the world, and yeah. Islam expands into East Africa. We see the slave trade continue. Um, I'd already mentioned that as many as 7 million slaves were traded from Africa to Asia, India in the, in the 1750 to 1850 period. Well, a lot of Muslim traders are merchants and they're sea merchants. A lot of them have ships. They trade all across the Indian Ocean and they become the leaders in this African uh, to Asia uh, slave trade. They become the leaders in this slave trade, trading millions of slaves over the coming century. Um, it's really almost identical to the slave trade that the Europeans did to the Americas. Uh, and I, yes, the Europeans to the Americas did about twice as many. Over the whole history of the period, from the 14 to the 1900s, about twice as many slaves were brought to the Americas. But we saw that chart before, like, what was it, something like, uh, I don't know, 16, 18 million slaves taken into the Americas. And seven, over the whole time period, seven to 12 million taken to Asia. And the Europeans, you know, 15, 1600 Europeans did a lot of that. But, uh, yeah, the slave trade dies off and sort of doesn't end, but 
really peters off in the Atlantic, and it picks up dramatically in the Indian Ocean going the other direction. The Swahili east coast of Africa. All right, we're going to shift gears here for the scramble for Africa. By 1914, almost the entire continent of Africa was under authority or control of some European nation, like 80% of the continent. Uh, that doesn't mean they had full-on established permanent government and they didn't have control of the whole region. Don't, don't misconstrue that. But they claimed it. Uh, they claimed control of it. Even though, for instance, northern Africa, almost all of northern Africa, like a third of the entire continent, was claimed by France uh, by early 1900s. But yet, almost the entire population that lived there was Muslim Africans and Middle Easterners, uh, Africans and Arabs. There was not, it was, it was France claiming rulership and France's military being there and in basically claiming ownership and dominance of the land. But the actual daily lives of the citizens were, I mean, you would have, 1900, you, you could have probably asked many citizens and they would have been like, and you say something like, do you realize that France claims all this and you're actually part of the French empire? They would have looked at you with a blank stare, like, what is France, you know, in their native language? I don't even know what you were talking about. So even though uh, France claimed it and was pulling resources out of it, it didn't necessarily affect everyone. And a lot of folks might have not even really been aware that uh, they were part of the French Empire. Um, yeah, uh, it's interesting. They're looking for natural resources. They wanted to make sure that it wasn't uh, everything wasn't gobbled up by the by the English or the French, for instance. And so we see pretty much every European empire try to get a piece of the world pie. And we call this the scramble for Africa. Now, this had been happening globally for centuries, but no one had necessarily tried to conquer Africa or claim Africa because everybody was using Africa as a as a resource. And everybody was doing it, and they had all these trade negotiations where they all basically agreed that we could all pull slaves and resources out of Africa. Well, with the slave trade dying up, everyone had been looking out, and now it's affecting trade and money around the world. Everyone starts looking at Africa and saying, okay, well, we can't pull the resources out as easily out of Africa anymore, so we're going to have to actually go into Africa and get the resources and build our infrastructure right there. We're going to have to build our mines there, build our farms there, build our plantations there, build our factories there, and then actually pull the stuff out much more uh, slowly and much more by hand and right in, we'll have to get right into it. And so these countries realize we got to lay claim. We got to basically grab the land, hence the scramble for Africa. Um, now, Christians often use a Christian justification for this. Uh, and of course, all Europe is Christian, pretty, you know, different types of Christianity, but all European nations, I think, would be thought of as Christian. I can't really think. Of course, south, very, very, very corner of Southeast Europe is really still part of the Ottoman Empire, but all the rest of Europe would be thought as Christian of some version. And they all kinds of justifications, believing that they were going to save the natives, save the savages, they were going to civilize them, they were going to Christianize them, they were going to bring... Uh, the light of civilization. There's ads. I don't know. I might even have one here in my notes. Or I might even have one in the slide somewhere. But there's... Um, I'm curious if I have it in here. It's something I used to show a picture of. Oh, yeah, I do. We'll have it much later. Uh, the pear soap advertisement. The idea of bringing light and bringing civilization to Africa. Were there some Christian missionaries that really, truly believed this? I'm sure there were. That really truly believed they were saving souls. I'm sure there's some were. But they didn't fund this on their own. Pri the primary funding for all of this scramble for Africa was governments, kings and governments and empires. So they might have sent these missionaries, usually accompanied by soldiers, uh, and the missionaries might have thought they were doing a good mission. But what they were really doing is they were really just supporting and doing the work for the empires that wanted to conquer these regions, to use their resources and the people to enrich the motherland, you know, back in Europe is really what it's about. Um, and to enrich themselves as well. Lots of business people, lots of merchants involved in this. Incredible amount of wealth being spent. And they expected a return on that. Um, 
And uh, saving their souls wasn't the return these businessmen and kings wanted. Uh, they wanted the revenue. It was about money and power. King Leopold II of Belgium here, for instance, he gained control of territory along the Congo River, uh, western, this is in western um, Africa. He did an interesting thing, though. He actually claimed all of it and his own, under his own name. He didn't actually claim it for the good of Belgium. He actually claimed it all as his own personal property. He basically carved out a chunk of Africa and said, I own that. Not Belgium. I do. It's mine. It's my own personal kingdom in Africa, the size of a country That's around the Congo River. He does this, and he does it. It's, it's hard to use the term legally. There's paperwork. There's treaties. There's documents. But what is this law, this international law that exists in uh, doing treaties with other countries and other continents? People don't even speak the same language. There's, it doesn't exist. Did he have paperwork and documents? He did. He had paperwork that there had been tribal chiefs along the Congo River that basically signed their land over to him. Did they even know what the language, did they even know what they were doing? It's very likely they had no clue. And even if they did, <coughs> what were they concerned about? Some king or some representative, some king from 5,000 miles away, what the heck's that going to have to do with us here? Anyway, he did this and he promised that he would spread Christianity and he would civilize the population. He would turn this Central African region into a Christian state in Central Africa, civilize, educate, Christianize, bring the light of civilization, is what he, is what he claimed. Um, some people were very nervous about this because he got this sort of this head start, and he claimed all this territory, and he didn't do it for the good of the kingdom. He, he said he did it for the good of the people, but he was the one generating the wealth and profit from it. So you see the Berlin Conference here was formed 1884-1845. It was organized by the, let's see if I have him on here, I have Bismarck on here. I think he was the king, maybe at this point in time they may have called him a, a president or something. No, we're going to go with, um, I don't know what his title is. I don't know. You can look it up if you're interested. He was the leader, though, of he was the leader of Germany, and he establishes these rules for European uh, imperialist competition within the African continent. They actually establish a framework and guidelines for how to divvy up, how to actually divvy up the continent, how to partition Africa among European powers. You know who wasn't involved in any of that? Any African, any African kings or lords or authorities? No, it was Europeans deciding what they were going to do with the entire continent. How they're going to cut it up amongst themselves. Ah, oh, man, the hubris, the arrogance of this. Um, uh, now, Otto did this for, he believed, good. And in truth, it, it probably was good. Because the purpose of this conference was to avoid warfare. Was to avoid a world war. He wanted this uh, to work, have peaceful negotiations, negotiating how they were going to divvy up Africa to avoid a global conflict between European powers. Now, none of that is concerned about the good or well-being of Africans. It's simply about the good of the European people. Um, that was the purpose. Uh, they agreed to a few things. They agreed to end slavery. The imperialism of Africa was, was sort of established at the beginning. That was sort of the whole purpose of it. But they also agreed to, to bring an end to slavery. The slave trade outside of Africa, not the slave trade inside of Africa, not, not buying and selling slaves in Africa and then enslaving them on plantation, but the global uh, slave trade over water. Uh, also, there was an agreement to Christianize and civilize them. That was the idea. Um, truth, we, we know looking back that all that was really done was it was really about money and trade and power. Again, I'm sure there was a few people who truly believed in it. I'm sure there was a few good people that believed they were helping and doing the right thing. Of course, they weren't. Even if they were going in there forcibly doing this to proselytize and evangelize and just to force, force these conversions, that isn't good. But even those that did actually have good intentions, it was almost irrelevant considering all the power and the status that was behind the kings and the emperors and the soldiers and all the weapons and money involved. That's really what it was about. Um, they wanted treaties to officially be signed, and they wanted it all the, um, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. They wanted it all official. 
um, to make it really look good for the world, to make it look good to all the people watching, so they could go back to their countries and say, hey, we've got these documents, we've got these treaties, we have these official things that we've signed with Africans. We're not mistreating them and, misbeha and misbehaving over there. We're not, we're not um, exploiting them and oppressing them and enslaving them. We're the good people. We're doing the good. We're helping them out. We are saving Africa. Um, even though there might have been some people that did believe that, we know that the actual leadership and the actual governments, that wasn't what it was about. It was about economy. It was about money. It was about, it was about uh, expansion of empire, what we call imperialism. Uh, violence was common in Africa under European rule. Leopold II, for instance, he established this Congo Free State. Uh, that was what it was called. It was the nation, this Congo Free State. It was about ivory and then later rubber. And, you know, these are the big things, but there's lots of other stuff in there, too. Ivory and rubber and sugar. We see uh, European companies operating there using slaves. They savagely mistreated, mistreated the Congo natives. Dismemberment was common. Torture was common. Rape, murder, uh, imprisonment, starvation. All these kinds of things were common. It became so bad that missionaries would come back and report what was happening in the Congo Free State and how terrible it was happening under the Leopold's rule, under the Belgium rule there. Um, and it really wasn't the country of Belgium. Um, I don't want to put Belgium off the hook or anything here, but it was really Leopold's private mercenary army. Um, it was brutal. Uh, there were, came all, back all kinds of, um, because we have photography by this time period. Photography comes out in the mid-1800s, 1860s really where it becomes a little more common. And so we have pictures of people being cut up and mutilated and brutalized and, and tortured and all kinds of crazy things. Um, pictures of hundreds of people walking around with no hands because their hands have been cut off because they stole something or they didn't, they didn't uh, bring enough treasure or they didn't bring enough gold or they didn't mine enough pr product or something or they stole food because they were starving. They were, it was inhuman. Inhuman doesn't even really describe it. It's, it's, a, it's the most terrible type of a horror movie you could imagine. Only real. Um, it actually got so bad that the people and the government of Belgium forced him to give it up. Forced him to actually sell it and um, uh, to give it over. And Belgium took it over and it became um, known as the Belgian Congo. Things did get a little better once Belgium went in and it had a little more actual governmental oversight, but marginally. Um, you know, as history of the world, you can look at a few people, you know, if you believe in good or bad or good or evil and wonder about who's evil, you know, or they're really, truly evil people. Yeah, whether you want to look at it religiously or not, some people are just so bad. What else can you call them but evil? Just like purely evil. Uh, Leo was one of those folks. The kinds of atrocities that happened under his rulership of that little private empire of his, that private kingdom. Was, but this might be maybe the absolute worst example of the incredible atrocities committed. But things like this were happening all across the continent. Um, the Congo Free State might have been one of the worst. Um, but these things happened all across the place. Here we have this also referred to as this partition of Africa. I sort of mentioned partitioning Africa. That's also an, uh, an official term historians give to it. Um, British, French, German. Um, how much is actually independent? I mean, hardly anything. Almost all of Africa, with a few little small independent regions, almost all of Africa was claimed by some European power. Uh, pretty bad. Pretty, 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 pretty bad. This doesn't actually last long, really. This whole partitioning of Africa and claiming of Africa is really only on solid ground for less than half a century. A lot of this happens in the mid-late 1800s. And by the end of World War I, uh, 1918, 19, uh, several of these countries get independence. By the 18, by 1920s, several other places get independence. And by the end of World War II, 1945, they're almost all independent. Uh, not all, but most. So it was the actual real true partitioning of Africa lasted less than, less than a century. Um, now that's still a couple generations, and it was brutal. 
and terrible and, and uh, oppressive and exploitive, as we talked about. I mean, you can't really you can't really do service by talking about it. It's the absolute worst of the worst of the worst worst. Worst worst. I mean, I don't really you can't really express how terrible it was. Words don't really do it justice. The kinds of terrible atrocities that were committed in the name of Christianity or in the name of expansion or the name of government or the name of the economy or the name of Islam. You can't really, you really can't describe the terrible things and the terrible consequences and the long-term consequences that are still being felt in that continent today. You try, but it's really hard. Um, Southern Africa in the 19th century. Uh, the Dutch East India Company established the Dutch East India Company, which is interesting. I don't actually have it on the slide. But anyway, the Dutch East India Company, which goes all the way back to, well, 1652. Um, it was established at uh, Cape Town, down the, the South Africa, the little tip, the Cape, the little tip of Africa, which we start, it's called the Cape, and then Cape Town, and eventually we call it South Africa. Um, uh, it was established 1652. It was a trading port. It really wasn't, or it was really a trading, refueling, rewatering port. It really wasn't meant to be anything major. It was just the people who went around Africa in the 1600s, they could stop there. They could do, do a little trading, but really it was about getting fuel, getting water, getting whatever they needed to continue their journey to uh, the east, and then, of course, on their way back. But because almost everyone who went to the east and the west, east and west, went through the Cape. Uh, it began to grow and becomes a major colony by the 1700s uh, with thousands of people, and it expands. And then as they live there, they expand into southern Africa and start realizing, hell, there's a lot of resources here available. There's a lot of things here that we can make money on. All these ships are going by all the time. We need to trade with them. And um, it becomes quite a successful trading colony and port itself. Um, these descendants of these early Dutch became known as the Afrikaners. Um, they became known as the Afrikaners. They're white. Um, the descendants of all these early uh, Dutch traders, these Dutch merchants. We see British people come in. The British folks come and start uh, sort of establish a foothold as well in the region. So we have the Dutch... We have the British down there. They, in a way, they combine forces for a while. If you've ever heard of Shaka Zulu, they combine against Shaka Zulu. Um, uh, the presence there became so oppressive that many African tribes rallied together. They waged war on the Afrikaners. They waged war on the British to try and push them off the continent, to basically try and get rid of them. Unfortunately, they waited far too long. Had they done that in the 1680s, might have worked. Who knows? Um, but waiting to the 1800s was the, the foothold there, the economic resources, the trade routes, the natural resources have been discovered. It was too late. Uh, the Europeans had far too much invested, and there was too much money potential, uh, economic potential there. So we do see Shaka, Zulu warriors fighting 1800s. Eventually, they do become conquered. Uh, by the British and the Afrikaners, um, yeah, um, they uh, conquer. Uh, it does, by 1900, sort of become a relatively equal, uh, relatively equal black-white society for a few, few years, where we have the British, the Afrikaners, and sort of working together with the actual African rulership in South Africa, and we see a sort of a peaceful period for a few decades at the end of the 1800s uh, to where it might be one of the better places where we do see white and black relations sort of normalize for a period of time. For a period of time. Then the diamonds happen. And that, yeah, then the diamonds happen. Um... Cecil Rhodes and the De Beers Mining Company. They established the diamond, di diamond industry in the 1890s. Well, it probably was established before, but it becomes successful and becomes well-known by the 1890s. I don't know the exact year necessarily that it was established. But it becomes well-known and starts making a lot of revenue selling diamonds globally by the 1890s. 
and they start opening up more diamond mines. This becomes the number one source of diamonds in the world. Um, and they start opening diamond mines. And initially, when they were first opened in the late 17, late 1800s, they were worked by whites and blacks. They were equal. Again, this sort of this equal society. We see white people in the mines, we see black people in the mines. Um, but by the 1890s, the miners, the people who work in the mines, are 90% black. Uh, almost exclusively black are working in the mines. The wages are poor. It's very dangerous in, to work in mines. Uh, lots of things happen. People die all the time. Um, and they become the ones working in the most dangerous underground jobs with the whites working the above ground, the safer jobs, other types of jobs. And the Africans slowly more and more by the early 1900s get pushed further into these more subservient, more um, domestic roles. They're not slaves, but they're pushed into the lowest level of society. It becomes a black and white stratified society. This sort of this equalish society lasted for a decade, maybe two. But by 1900, we are basically have created a, or they created a class society in Africa, in South Africa, with blacks at the bottom, whites at the top. And all the most dangerous jobs, the most menial jobs, the poorest income jobs, almost all are being done by the black African uh, South Africans. Now, then the British and the Afrikaners, over the access to trade, economics, and money, and the mines, go to war with each other. Uh, the British go to war with the Dutch. They had sort of peacefully ruled the... the I should say something interesting here. This was never really like a state or a country. South Africa, for all these centuries, for, for what, 16, 17, 1800s, was really a business venture. It was never really what we think of as like a, a, a state, an official like state with a government and everything. Uh, it was really a large scale business venture. Now, admittedly, I don't know if I really made that clear. Most colonial, I think I mentioned it. Uh, most colonies in the 15, 1600s were established that way, including here in the Americas, uh, what becomes North America. They were established as business ventures uh, for trade and transport and goods and production and transporting of materials. Um, and then sort of the government and the law and the sort of standard political stuff comes in later. It never really happened down here in South Africa. For over two centuries, it was basically just ran as a huge business. The entire Cape area was this, this production business. And sort of the British and the Dutch were partners doing this together. 1899, the British actually declare war on the Afrikaners. Um, too much money, too much wealth, too much revenue flowing. The Brits wanted it. They didn't want the Afrikaners to have it. And the Afrikaners, these white Southern Africans. Now, they promise the Afrikaners representative government as one of the conditions. The Afrikaners do surrender in 1902, this Boer Wars. Um, the Boers, the, the Boers are the British. The, if I didn't say that before, that's the British. Um, the Boers, uh, they do win. They do conquer and defeat the Afrikaners. So these Dutch Afrikaners, they surrender. Um, uh, and we actually do get an actual government formed, really, truly a government formed, which is known as the Union of South Africa, created in 1910. And they agree that it will be ruled by both Afrikaners and the British, but under the British crown. It will officially become part of England. It will be part of England, but the Afrikaners get joint rulership in the government. Now, bear in mind, all this is still just white people. Uh, it's still just a bunch of white people at the top. The businessmen, the merchants, the elite, the ones with all the money and the power, all basically fighting and negotiating over all of the wealth that is potential and being generated by South Africa, primarily being generated by blacks. Um, yeah. Uh, this becomes a completely segregated society, completely segregated, separated, white-black society, white supremacy, um, and it's, it's, it's actually, if you even compare it to what we had in America, it was worse. Um, it was actually worse because in, in America, you had the slaves, yes. Uh, you can't really say anything about that. But we also had hundreds of thousands of free blacks, which were able to sort of have regular lives. 
Uh, yes, they were still considered inferior by most, but you had blacks that could be educated, they could have jobs, they could have, they were free. So you had hundreds of thousands of free blacks that, especially in the northern colonies, that li were able to live relatively normal lives. Relatively. Again, not perfectly. They were still black and still considered inferior, but they were able to live relatively normal working, laboring lives, as, you know, as great as that life was for anybody. Um, not so South Africa, uh, they weren't technically slaves, but they were treated as a really low class, really, uh, they were, the laws actually allowed them to be physically abused, beaten, uh, and these were the free blacks. These were the free blacks, had no rights, no authority, no voting, uh, they couldn't own anything, they were paid terrible, they had no anything, they had no voice, um, yes. Uh, slavery aside, being a free black in South Africa was even even worse than being a free black in the, in the states. It was it became bad, and by the mid eight, mid nineteen hundreds, it becomes what it would some would say the most oppressive and violent uh, uh, against African whites oppressing Africans by mid by after World War II of any place in the world. It's gets really bad. Uh, that leads us into you know things we'll talk about much later, apartheid and all that later on. It, it's really interesting. And I think I like to spend a minute talking about this period after Shaka Zulu and the treaties that were signed. For a little brief period there, the agreement among the leadership of the blacks, the Afrikaners, and the Boers was sort of a tripartite, three-way system of equality. And it actually looked good there for, it didn't last long though. The diamonds really screwed it all up, the amount of wealth that was being generated. But you have to ask the question, if it wasn't the diamonds, it would have been something else. Uh, because nowhere in the world were whites treating Africans equally, that I'm really aware of. Uh, so would it have really lasted? Yeah. Boer Republics. We see the battles there, the Zulu battles. Uh, 78, 79, uh, and he was successful. He really, for a very short period of time, what Shaka did was quite good. Uh, now, he was a warlord. He was a conqueror because before he actually launched his attack against the whites, he conquered his own other people. So he violently conquered other African tribes, united them by force, and then rose up against the, Af against the whites uh, in such numbers by combining multiple tribes that he was actually able to force the whites to, they didn't just surrender, but they had, they forced them to sign a treaty, uh, out of fear of, of much further and greater violence. So it was a success story for a short period of time anyway. All right. Colonialism's impact after 1900. So these are sort of the results of all of this. Uh, and nothing is this, and this is really good. All right. Uh, most tribes realize that resistance was, was, uh, you know, quote Star Trek, resistance is futile. It really was. Uh, these Europeans were hundreds of years more advanced technologically and militarily. There was, ultimately at the end of it, there was nothing the Africans could really do to stop this. There was no real capability. Uh, that there's nothing I could really do. Resistance didn't really matter. The more you resisted, the simply more pain and misery the Europeans brought down upon them. Um, they were simply forced to adapt to the new the new ways. Um, because any time there was any type of serious, serious resistance or, or uprising, the Europeans, it might take them a year to get there. It might take them a year to get enough troops there, but the Europeans would eventually show up and squash it. Uh, with a uh, massed military force. Um, yeah. Europeans had no interest, no real interest. They talked it all the time. They talked it internationally, but they had no real interest in educating or providing social services, so we need see, we see none of that. Um, we don't see anything about Africa becoming safer or better. Uh, and not only did they not provide those, they hindered it for the actual local institutions in Africa from trying to educate or improve their own lives in their own societies, because uh, Europeans didn't want that. They didn't want the Africans getting technology. They didn't want the Africans getting educated. They didn't want Africans speaking up and, and learning the real ideas of, oh my God, imagine Africans learning enlightenment thinking. 
and actually speaking up and talking about, hey, we should overthrow our rulers, or this is unjust, it's tyranny. It's so freaking ironic. All of the shit that the Europeans talked about, about overthrowing tyranny and the rights of man, every bit of it just seemed to cease to exist when they were dealing with Africa. Because all of that would have applied to African peoples, and of course it would have been them pushing off the yoke of the white Europeans, who were all the tyrannical. It, it's, but the irony of it is, I don't know that it's lost on Europeans. These people aren't stupid. A lot of them are educated. They, I don't know if they're stupid or just because they had such strongly held belief that Africa, that blacks were not men or, or uh, they were not appropriate or they were not deserving or they simply didn't care about the hypocrisy. It was about money and that's all that mattered. I think it was probably all of the above, probably. Um, uh, we do see some types of development, like infrastructure. Um, we do see some railroads being built in Africa, uh, some economic development, transportation industry increase. They wanted to train the, the Europeans built transportation industry because it facilitated their ability to trade, trade goods and to make more money quicker and faster and more efficiently. Uh, to trade and move goods in and out of the continent. Um, directly, typically the trains went directly from the raw materials and the raw resources right to the coast. So basically, uh, get the resources, put them on the train, take it straight to the coast, put it on a ship, and send it right to Europe. That was the idea. Um, uh, oh, there's another thing, too. It also served a security and military needs. If there was an uprising, if there was some type of African warlord that got an army together, which happened, then it was much quicker and easier for the Europeans to show up at the ships, offload the soldiers, equipments, guns, cannons. Uh, and by 1900, there's advanced weaponry. Like there's some, there's artillery and cannons, and there's some advanced stuff that can really, really mess people up. Um, and they could load all the stuff onto trains and ship it right out to where it needed to be to basically offload their military and to put down any type of resistance. Yeah. Um, officials warned uh, about a total abolition of slavery. Lots of government officials in Europe warned that you could not truly abolish slavery, not fully, um, um, which is ironic because as determined at the conference under Bismarck and for the past several decades, the argument had been from European leaders that slavery needed to end, and that's why we were moving our, uh, basically our facilities into Africa. It'd be more beneficial for the Africans. They can actually work and make money and civilize, et cetera, et cetera, which wasn't happening. Um, but we are also in the slave trade. What we see by the early 1900s, we see some, some late 18, early 1900s, some Europeans actually arguing against that and saying, well, wait a second. Um, maybe that, that slavery really, maybe we need some of the slavery, actually. Um, they would say a few different things, like, well, you know, there's there's other slave trade going. There's Muslims who are doing slave trade. Uh, there's slave trade going east, which is quite prosperous. Um, yeah, things like that. Uh, we see that. So what we do see is we do see some of these governments actually having Africans, free or slave, get paid and they would actually have jobs and get paid and make money um, and have real jobs, real economic participation. Now, initially when they did this, it was meant as a smoke screen. So they could claim, all right, well, we have these people here, they're getting, they're getting paid, they're not, they're not slaves, they're getting paid, they're making money. Um, we think that actually contributes to an economic system being established where we start seeing more revenues being generated in the continent for people who live in the continent. Not necessarily the, the lower income folks, but we see more middle income folks, middle and, and upper income folks start to realize, well, we can make money here and have revenues here actually in Africa, free and slave people participating. And yes, eventually by the early 1900s, we have slaves getting paid in some places. And we do start to see the erosion of the slave system. Um, generally speaking, we believe slavery has been officially sort of officially ended, officially ended by around 1900. Um, 
with the understanding that technically even today, there's places in Southeast Asia where slavery exists. Slavery and fishing boats, of course, sexual slavery, things like that. But there is a general idea that all governments either abolished it or condemned it by 1900. Uh, even though at the time, the slave trade was still pretty significant, especially going east. And again, we're really talking about Europe here. We're not really seeing it in the Islamic world. Um, uh, there's still several countries in the Middle East that have never officially abolished slavery. Even though it doesn't, it's not really there anymore. It doesn't really happen. But there's several countries that actually haven't officially abolished slavery. Um, it just sort of stopped being done but yeah it does decline it really does uh, by the early 1900s the international slave trade with ships is mostly over the land trade in eastern and africa into the middle east still exists into basically well the ottoman empire still conducted slave still conducted the slave trade and it fell well 1911 1912 right before world war one is when the Ottoman Empire collapses, and they were still doing slavery right up to before the war. Um, but we do find that most people who would be quote-unquote slaves aren't really slaves anymore. They're getting some type of pay by World War I, 1914. Um, that doesn't mean their lives aren't still similar. That doesn't mean their lives aren't literally the life of, of an oppressed, exploited person. Um, they just might not technically be considered slaves anymore. But in practical purposes, it doesn't mean they're being treated much better. All right. So we have a new type of imperialism that develops in this time period globally. Now, we've been talking specifically about Africa, but this is now more of a global thing we'll be talking about here. Um, there's really four causes of this new type of imperialism. And this idea of conquering and controlling. Uh, best way to put it would be maybe the whole package. Previously, empires were involved in one piece. You know, the trade here or the trade there, economic advantage here, maybe something being sold over here. But what the empires wanted to do is they wanted to control all of it. They wanted to control the market. They had the industrial power. They wanted to control the economy. They wanted it for military uses. Um, they wanted it to show that they were stronger, more powerful than other nations. Uh, it was te technical in uh, technology was involved in this. It was the whole package. Imperialism, keep it simple, the early few centuries of imperialism in the 1600s, it was just about money. It was really just about money. Money and markets. Money and markets um, and the resources that were used to generate that. Now, by 1900, it's way bigger than that. It's about the entire economy. It's about, it's about global control, global dom dominance of the markets. It's about sociocultural. It becomes the way of life of European countries. Um, there's technologies that are being learned by world trade. There's military expansion, military technologies being learned by world trade. Um, there's new settlements, new groups expanding across the world. Um, colonies in 1600 were only meant to be there temporary for a while to generate resources and revenue. Now they're permanent. They want them to be permanent and they want these permanent expansions of their countries to be permanent forever. Um, changes uh, sort of the worldview. Instead of more of a short-term um, short term gain, some countries start looking at the real long-term and wanting this type of expansion globally to be forever, permanent, um, which, which changes how they look at it and how they act and how they react to other countries, which, unfortunately, a lot of this is what brings us to World War I. And a lot of this are causes or things that, that really uh, facilitate the hatred, the violence, and the animosity between European countries, which leads to the First World War. All right, so one of these primary motives was concerns of economic competition for European powers. Talked about that. Uh, England was having a hard time maintaining its goals and its leading. It was, it was uh, really leading 
uh, the world had been leading the world for a long time. It was having a hard time maintaining industrialization, competition with other nations. We've talked about that. Um, uh, most of Africa did not get into the hands of the British. The British actually got a very small piece. Uh, most, uh, the rest of Africa was taken up by other European countries. England only got a little bit of it. They had a hard time, so they wanted to increase their strength and authority. Um, they wanted to increase the resources and their market share. So these Europeans, uh, in general, consider these colonies to be true extensions of their countries now. Um, some of them actually take to force relocations. We see uh, England doing this. We see France doing this. We see Germany doing this. Forcibly relocation, relocating populations to other colonies and other continents. Um, forcing them, forcing thousands of people to go there. Or through coercion um, to f get people to go there so that they can establish permanent footholds in these places that will be actually become part of their nations, uh, extended nations across the globe. Um, some thought that it was necessary, uh, again, for security, military power necessary. Um, you have to prove you're strong, you're powerful. And of course, the idea the most powerful nation can control the most territory and the most land. They really can. Um, I don't know if I really talk about this. I haven't really mentioned Darwinism or anything. Um, I could spend a half hour going over Darwinism. I'm not going to do that. Um, Darwinism was this, this, this idea initially created by Darwin, which was about animals evolving natural selection and becoming more evolved and advancing. Uh, but Darwin said they could also go backwards as well. People took this and started applying this to humans and social interactions among humans and social institutions that we call this social Darwinism. It's BS, it's bullshit, it's not real science. Um, but they took this idea of this, this, uh, this natural selection and turned it into what is referred to as the survival of the fittest, which conveniently enough for social Darwinists was white Christians. Uh, and this include Americans. Americans are a big part of this. Uh, Americans, uh, many Americans bought entirely in this idea of social Darwinism. And so we go from actual science, natural selection, Darwin, to this fake science, this, this social Darwinism, uh, the idea that whites and Christians are the superior among all humans, and therefore we were naturally selected, and we should then, of course, dominate the world and spread our, our civilization and technology and religion and culture around the world. So, many Europeans bought into this as well, many governments bought into this, many religious people bought into this, and so we see this as a global social Darwinism. Uh, Europeans are going to spread the light uh, of European civilization and culture and religion to the world, um, usually at gunpoint, usually. Um, so, these were the strongest, and they had to really create this social Darwinist on a... Um, global scale and remember this is not science this is garbage it's 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 just used to justify uh, oppression of non-whites and non-christians globally um, that's what it's used for exploitation and oppression of everyone else who's who's not white or christian is really what it's being used for uh to conquer the rest of the world Militarily, socio, culturally, religious, and economically. All right, we see some examples of technological military superiority here. Machine gun, by early 1900s, a machine gun. Nothing the world compares to it. It is, it is. Well, for instance, this way: World War One. Spoiler alert. Give you a moment to close your ears. Eight million people die. Okay, you're good now. Um, in case that's a spoiler for when we talk about it, uh, the machine gun is responsible for half of those deaths just in World War One, um, It's a terrible, 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 terrible weapon uh, that was used to kill so many people. Um, no clone, no, no indigenous population in the world could stand up to a, this weapon. Um, and Europeans were primarily the ones that were using this by the early 19-teens, early 1900s. Uh, no one can really compete with it. Um, it allowed killing on a grand mass scale unlike had never been seen before. Um, primarily people they fought globally were using spears, bows, and arrows. Um, even an old-fashioned rifle from the 16, 1700s, it's, yeah, it's in insignificant or meaningless compared to this weapon, really. Uh, and then you have quinine. 
quinine allowed basically taking quinine led you to control malaria. Um, malaria was a barrier in Africa. Basically, Europeans that showed up in Africa had no immunity to malaria. Now, malaria killed Africans um, who had lived there forever and had natural immunity to malaria, and still Africans died from malaria. Europeans showed up, and you got bit by a mosquito, you were done. Um, uh, some some things I've read, like 17, 1800s, like 60, 70% of Europeans that actually spent any significant amount of time actually on the continent died. Um, there's other diseases too. Malaria was terrible. But then someone uh, develops and invents quinine, which gives you a really strong, uh, it's really strong medicine um, to help you protect you from malaria. Uh, it's still not 100%, but it worked really well. And this allowed Africans, or this allowed Europeans to basically filter out through Africa now where they were able to be protected from African uh, diseases and stuff like this, and uh, which allowed them to much more easily invade the continent. They were able to do that now without this one particular thing that was almost a guaranteed killer. Makes a huge difference. Special interest groups. Uh, now, again, technological military superiority, that's just two very th small things. There was lots of others, lots of other stuff. Uh, by 1914, we have tanks. Uh, we do actually have tanks. So, yeah. Special interest groups were highly influential in convincing countries to expand their colonies or economic investments. These groups included settlers and missionaries and military officials, all seeking to advance empire, all seeking to push their particular agenda, their military goal, their political goal, their religious goal, their um, economic goals. The list goes on and on. Um, Africa was just seen as a prize. Now... Asia, too. Southwest Asia and Southeast Asia, to a degree, as well. We do see some of this, too. But Indian population um, was stronger, and it wasn't quite as easily... Uh, Brit the Brits do eventually take over India, but it's never a peaceful control, ever. Um, Indian population was far more resistant um, or complicit, uh, either way you want to look at it. And, uh, you know... It doesn't ever really happen in, in China, really, uh, for instance. A missionary school. All right. So we have this African missionary school um, being taught. How are the children being encouraged to view the German Empire? And we have the Emperor of Germany and the Empress of Germany right up there in front of them. They're staring at them all day long. So it's African school. Um, this is a staged photo, by the way. This is a staged propaganda photo. Um, uh, the illiteracy rate in Africa in 1900, no one has statistics, you know, there's no real statistics, but most historians say we probably approach 98% um, uh, as far as uh, reading and writing, uh, like 98%. Um, so whatever effect this had was very, very minimal, even if a few of these schools did exist. Um, but of course, right up there, up in front and center, is the uh, German emperor, is the you know, German territory empress. Stare at them all day long, right? Um, it's almost like their parents are right there. Mom and dad, that's supposed to be the idea of them, that they're right there looking over. Um... This is how Europeans want they how you, how European authorities wanted European citizens to see this that Europeans showed up they educated the population they civilized them educated them they cleaned them up they put them in chairs they gave them clean shirts clean clothes um, gave them teachers professors uh, to actually educate them um, I see a lot of Europeans that sort of thought of themselves this way as sort of the the parent figures, uh, the country as the parent figures raising Africans. And even though in this image is, these are kids, many Europeans would have actually seen it that way. It would have been um, pa um, patronizing towards that, looking down on Africans and saying, applying to all African peoples, whether it is children, adults, the government even, we're going to show you the right way. We're going to civilize you and show you the right way to govern, the right way to worship, the right way to have knowledge. Yeah. Um, this is certainly the idea of German propaganda. Uh, you got to think about who the audience is, who their audience are talking about here, who's the focus of this, who is uh, 
you know, I, I sort of said that this isn't for Africans. Um, now, it might, I mean, don't get me wrong. They might have showed it to some African leaders and be like, hey, you let, pardon me, you let us come in and this is what we'll do. This was really for the people back home. This is really to sort of uh, appease the populations back in on Europe and show, you know, this is what we're there for. This is why we're doing this, what we're going through all this for. This is all the advantages we have by basically taking over Africa. Um, the reality is schools would have probably been much worse than this, much dirtier than this, much more filthy than this, um, a lot less organized than this. Yeah, most likely. This gives the implication that schools are organized and well-equipped and that the Germans are doing a thorough job of civilizing the population. Yeah. But um, if this was really widespread going across Africa, there's actually some good education. Education's always good. Uh, if nothing else, a few people get educated enough that they rise up and start looking around and be like, this is wrong. We're going to try to fix it. We're going to do something about it. Um, uh, but we don't think even for a moment that this was widespread in Africa in any way, shape, or form. We don't believe. There isn't tons and tons of evidence by the mid-1900s when most African nations are free independent. Uh, people who've lived there for generations, who are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, who talk about the way it was in 1900. No. There's, there's a, almost zero evidence of this type of stuff we see in this picture actually really happening on any type of widespread scale. Is incredibly limited. Might have happened in a few t cities. Might have seen a little bit of this in a few urban areas. Um, Christian schools like this, or even Muslim schools like this. Um, uh, we do see a few of those things actually really happening. And if, truth, truthfully, the Muslims probably did more than we did. Um, uh, usually, they brought Islamic law in with them and education with them into North and Eastern Africa. Um, um, however, the issue is. By 1914, the Christians control all of Africa. So whatever influences, uh, slave, of course, is, slavery, of course, is terrible. But what actual positive influences Muslims would have brought to northern and eastern Africa are almost entirely extinguished by the early 1900s because Christians move in and take it all over. Um, yeah. All right. We're getting there. We're getting there. A civilizing mission. This is again. This is how it was often categorized. It's a civilizing mission. We're civilizing Africa. Um, um, Europeans colonized it. They felt it was primitive. They thought it was dirty duty to to civilize. Um, the excuse they used to justify invading, controlling the continent. We've covered all that really. 1899, Rudyard Kipling writes this uh, poem, um, sort of dramatizing it. Uh, sort of this what was expected of Europeans in Africa after seeing what happened, um, this white man's burden. Now, in 1898, again, this is where I'm covering right now, so I'm going to be really, really quick on this. There's a Spanish-American war. We go to war with Spain to, uh, to free Cuba. We do free Cuba. And then what do we do? In the agreement with Spain, we take over the Philippines. We pay them a bunch of money, $20 million or something. And we take over the Philippines, and then we start a war with the Filipinos from 1898 to 1901 or 2, which is sort of this um, American-Filipino war where we basically, ins uh, we basically oppress and uh, murder uh, about 200,000 Filipinos, the U.S. government does. Rudyard Kipling was there. Uh, at some point in time, and he saw what the Americans were doing to the Filipinos and the oppressive, the violence, the killing, the, the massacres, the prison camps. Yeah, it's ironic. Everything that we said the Spanish were doing bad to the Cubans, which they were, two years later, we turn around and do the same exact thing to the Filipinos. Um, I go into more detail on that in the U.S. history class. Anyway, so Kipling sees this, and he starts writing about this, and uh, he talks about this. Um... This idea is white man's burden. It's a satire. He taught the white man's burden poem is basically about how white people have to spread the light and civilize the world. It's irony. Some people have taken it as literal. No, it's irony. It's satire. He meant the exact opposite. Um, that this terrible thing whites are doing by thinking they have to civilize the world is actually bringing death and destruction. Um, in this case, uh, Americans doing it to the Filipinos. 
Uh, Philippines. Da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, there we go. All right. Um, we see a lot of missionaries floating around all around the globe. Christian missionaries from America or from other, lots of other European countries. They're going globally. I mean, the United States alone, um, in the late 18, early 1900s, sent over a million missionaries across the world. Um, now, most of these are private. Again, they're private. They're private churches, private institutions. It's not government doing it, although the government funded a lot of it um, because the missionaries were associated with our our own expansion and imperialism around the globe like the Europeans were doing, uh, although not nearly to the scale they were doing it. And uh, so these missionaries were floating all around the globe, Protestant missionaries, Catholic missionaries, all kinds, going around the world, looking and seeing all this stuff uh, in person happening, uh, participating in it, some, some rejecting it, some arguing against it, some writing out about how terrible it was, uh, some. Majority not so. There was actually only a few voices that were really truly outspoken against this imperialism we were doing. Um, we see these uh, missionaries in Africa, in South America, in the Middle East, we see it uh, Southeast Asia, we see it in Australia, the Aborigines, we see it all across. Um, little success, little success. Um, we'd always been trying to civilize the civilize, you know, um, to Christianize the natives, whether it was Native Americans, Native Africans, uh, Southeast Asian, Aborigines in Australia, wherever, always been trying to do that. And there never really been much success. The Catholic Jesuits spent 150 years in North America trying to uh, Christianize the uh, Native Americans. By most accounts, maybe, maybe 6,000. There's records that show maybe 6,000 converts out of millions. It was never effective. Um, very, it was never effective. And it was even worse in uh, uh, Africa because Islam had been pretty much well situated in Africa for a thousand years. And so even if you weren't Islamic, as we sort of said, a lot of people in rural areas were more animistic. The only religion they'd really known or had even any knowledge of, because Christianity had basically been absent from northern Africa for close to you know, a thousand years, a lot of them didn't realize it. So if they were going to convert to a religion... It was going to be Islam. It was going to be Christianity. Islam, of course, was familiar. Christianity wasn't. So as a result, they don't have much success. Uh, there is not really any type of widespread Christian success. Are there pockets? Yeah, there's little places now and then. There's pockets, and some of them grow over, over, over the time. Again, you know, there's, uh, there's several million Christian, um, um, Chinese Christians. Um, you see Christianity take hold in certain places in Southeast Asia. Uh, the Catholics were quite successful in the Americas. The um, majority of Latinos are, are Catholic or something, or, or Catholic belief. So there's a few places it was successful. But in Asia, not really. In Africa, not really. Um, didn't really happen for a variety of reasons. Their claim was to basically spread the Christian faith around the world and didn't really work. Obviously, there were some convert converts, but it was not any type of mass conversion that just didn't happen. Um, yeah. Here's the pear soap advertisement. This is, a, this is an advertisement for soap. Um, white man's burden. You gotta look at this image, and I'm actually not going to go into this image because I want you to look at it yourself and think about it. Maybe zoom in on it a little bit. Look at all the different parts of it. The most important word I want you to look at is lightening. Lightening the white man's burden. Making something whiter. Now, it's a soap ad, right? Yeah, this is way more than a soap ad. This is propaganda. This is social Darwinism. This is racial, cultural imperialism. All wrapped up into this. Um, now, this company was involved in this, heavily involved in this, because it was getting its palm oil to make its soap from Africa. So this was one of those companies, probably owned by one of those people. I can't speak to that. I don't know who the owner was. I can't say that for sure. But most likely, the people who owned this company were one of these economic leaders, one of these merchant lords, one of these business leaders that knew what was happening. 
had the plants and factories in Africa, pulling the palm oil out, having it transported around the world to their factories wherever they were. Um, this company like this and thousands of others and governments, this they were the ones doing all this. All for economic gain. So you got to look at it. you have this Englishman here. You have this captain looking out this little this little uh, the porthole here. He's washing his hands. He's all in white. They're lightening the white man's burden. Virtues of cleanliness. Cleanliness next to godliness. Virtue, of course. Virtue is, is a religious thing. The idea of having virtues and morals. Um, pear soap, a potent factor in brightening the dark dark corners of the earth. What does that mean? Dark corners of the earth. It should be obvious. Dark corners of the earth. Uh, civilization advances. I mean, it's it's slapping you in the face. Uh, while amongst the cultured of all nations, and of course, who are the cultured of all nations? Who are the all nations are speaking about? The cultured. It held. It holds the highest place as the ideal toilet soap. Um, all of that, other than maybe the whole ideal toilet soap. All the rest of that is geopolitical, racial, social Darwinism. Like the whole rest of that. Um, look at the imagery. Uh, you have the ship sailing. You have the trade here. You have all the goods being shipped out. Pear soap in the ships. Uh, you have the African. You have the missionary, the Christian missionary, with his hand down to the African who's down on the ground kneeling. And what's he handing him? He's handing him a bar of soap. Because that's what the African native needs. All the issues, all the things going on in his life. The thing that would make his life better is a bar of soap. Um, it's, it's just... I hope you get it. I hope you're seeing it. I hope you're getting what the, the real, the real meanings behind all this. The real backstory to all of this, um, what this represents and what it stands for and how it sort of is representative of all the stuff we've been talking about, all this, this stuff. Um, yeah, let's see if there's anything else in my notes I want to mention. The different colors, the dark, the light, the civilization, the whole imagery there with, with the missionary and the ships and the sailing, um, the trade. Uh, the white captain in the white clothes, um, the native, the racial of inferior superiority, um, yeah, the culture of all nations, yeah. What does white represent besides just the race? What other things do you think about? You think about white. Religiously, what are the other aspects of white? What does it mean culturally, morally? Um, yeah, really interesting. He's he's got a signet on his shoulder, most likely that like he's looks like he's got like four stars on there or something. So I mean, it could be a general, uh, an admiral. Um, there's a the military. There's the military aspect of this because most of the time. For these economic, for these businesses to come in, the missionaries to come in, they couldn't just walk up and just start dealing with the Africans overnight because they would be attacked potentially or the, the cells could be captured or treated as enemies or something. So when the mm, businessmen showed up, when the missionaries showed up, they were almost always escorted by soldiers to ensure their safety. Um, yeah. All right, next. Were there critics? Yeah, there were. Um, there were certainly people who spoke out against it. There always are naysayers. Uh, that's not the right word to use. Uh, maybe it's not the right word to use. Let's just say critics. There's always critics. There's always people who speak out and talk and say, this isn't right, this is wrong. Um, sometimes for the right reasons, that it's truly wrong to do it. Uh, sometimes for the other reasons I mentioned, you know, let's not do that because it leads into competition. We don't want that, or we don't want um, uh, the market being diluted with uh, cheap goods from somewhere. So, uh, or racial mixing. 
That was always an argument made, one of the critics of this. Um, you don't want racial mixing. You don't want blacks and whites to mix. You don't want uh, those other cultures, other religions, other ideas, the uncivilized to mix with the civilized. Um, um, our own presidents wrote about this in the 1920s. Our own presidents talked about how we didn't want the... Uh, uh, the natural laws of society and nature uh, proscribe, which means uh, they don't want to happen. They proscribe the mixing of races. We saw this kind of language from the President of the United States in the 1920s. Um, uh, Harding, I think. Uh, don't quote me, but I believe it's Harding. So this is an idea that's per pervasive in Europe and America for instance. Um, but some people had it on the right side. Some people thought it was just bad to do it. J.A. Hobson, he wrote Imperialism. He really took aim at imperialism. He took aim at the, the detrimental effects of imperialism. He argued that this unregulated capitalism, it instigated quests for empire, and he believed it led to warfare. In this time period when he wrote this, they were European countries really weren't at war. However, he was right, because this imperialism is really what causes World War I. Um, only it's not imperialism over Africa, directly, indirectly, but directly it's imperialism over Europe, southeastern Europe, uh, is really what leads to this. But all the tensions, um, it's sort of like what happened in southeastern Europe was the match that lit the fire, but the fire, the, the dry sticks of the fire had actually been built for decades, large part due economic to uh, cult, to worldwide imperialism, uh, with Africa right at the center of it, um, and he was right. This unregulated imperialistic capitalism is going to lead to destruction and violence, and it took a while, but it did indeed happen. Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. He accused Europeans of pure selfishness, even to the point of of of, of practically calling Europeans evil as they destroyed, how to put this, he was one of the other side. He was one of the ones that, um, he believed what was happening it was terrible in Africa, not for the Africans. It was terrible because white people that went there had their character and their soul destroyed. Now, two ways. Destroyed because of the influences of Africans, would actually sort of uh, pollute a good white person, culturally and intellectually, but also because of the activities that white people were required to do. If you went to Africa, you were required to be part of the imperialistic system. You really were. Um, if you went there as a white person from Europe, you really you were part of the system, whether it was military, economic, religion, you were part of the system. Um, you, you could try and resist it, you could try to talk out against it, and you could try to criticize it, but really, if you were there as a white person in Africa, you were the, you were in the system. You were part of this oppression exploitation of Africa. And so he argued that that also destroyed you. Um, you were, you were being destroyed because you were being forced to do bad things. Um, secondarily, or even tertiary, was really about the issue of the Africans. Um, that was sort of a, a tertiary second, third thought, really. Uh, the primary thing was what was happening to the white people going there. You can see where he's arguing against imperialism, but for the wrong reasons, really. I'm not saying he's wrong, uh, but yeah, wrong reasons. If anyone's ever seen Apocalypse Now, uh, it's, this is what it is. It, the movie Apocalypse Now is based on this, um, and what happens to, um, the major or whatever the heck he is, whoever the 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 um, Marlon Brando's character, whatever happens to him, you know, in Vietnam is it's you know it's an allegory is that the right word? But anyway, it's, it's really this our heart of darkness is what it's about. Um, really, um, excellent movie, excellent movie, of course, completely unrelated, but yet the fact it's based on heart of darkness, so it's interesting to mention. Um, many critics also were concerned that European powers were displaying a very double standard in their ideals. Uh, they were being very publicly noble, acting noble, and acting noble and righteous, all these things we've talked about. 
But in Europe, people were beginning to gain more more uh, representative governments. We see democracy or representative democracy starting to form in some European countries. And we start talking more about individual liberties, individual freedoms. And many would look around and say, we're not doing this for Africans. There are people in the early 1900s that are, that are actually speaking out and criticizing this, and they are oblivious to race. They're saying, it doesn't matter if they're black. They have rights. They have, respon they have rights. They have freedoms. They have intri intrinsic liberties that we're taking away from them. It should be noted these are minorities. Um, I saw a historical, um, sort of a historical summation in grad school, sort of from this time period of late 18, early 1900s, trying to add up all the uh, scholarly uh, works that were written, either pro-imperialism and expansion, economy, pro-religious uh, conversion, all the things that would be sort of pro-imperialist whether it was economic or military or religion, and the things that were anti against it, about 3%, about 3% of the writings this historian found were actually critical of imperialism. Most of the writings were things that dealt with these topics, were pro-imperialistic or neutral. Some were neutral on it, but uh, only about 3% were actually truly outspoken and critical um, yeah all right African and Asian resistance we're getting towards the end here first of all little just to start with that there was little resistance um, um, there wasn't a lot most cases Europeans industrial military superiority was simply too much too dominant um, but we also find another route there's two routes the first is the biggest obvious one. Um, industrially, militarily, uh, any one single country in Africa, any one single European country was probably the equal of the entire continent of Africa. Um, uh, not to mention you've got almost every European country taking a, a slice of Africa in this partition um, of Africa. So militarily, industrially, economically, there was literally no chance Africa ever had. It's just there wasn't. Um, uh, but the one which is a little less obvious is the actual participation, the actual collusion participation of the actual African locals, the people who live there, typically the elites, government officials, warlords, chieftains, the handful of rich people, um, often um, worked with the Europeans who would show up because they saw a way to do two things to enrich themselves, of course, money and power, and secondly, to insulate themselves from the effects so they themselves didn't get exploited or oppressed by the Europeans. So they could avoid themselves being damaged by the system and exploited and oppressed by the Europeans and having their things taken away from them, their liberties and freedoms, um, while simultaneously enriching and empowering themselves. Whether they become leaders, government leaders, economic leaders, they get to own the factories, uh, political leaders, presidents, warlords, you name it. So the one is obvious, but the other is actually less obvious, but this actually happened a lot. If they could enlist local leadership, whether it was economic or military or political, um, that was half the battle right there without firing a shot. And it was usually done by simply promises. You get to stay in power. You get a cut of the profits, and you let us do whatever we want with your country. And that was usually the way it worked. Let's sign some paperwork. Um, yeah. There was always some resistance. There was always something. There was always some type of resistance. Um, it did grow over the 20th century. Again, most of this, by at the, at the turn of the century, 1900, pretty much all of Africa was in the hands of Europeans. Um, but by the middle of the 20th century, 1950s, after World War, um, World War II, we do start to see most of it actually start to sort of come about. We see people vocalizing opposition to European, people looking for, um, looking for independence, looking for asking for assistance or help. 
for other countries, uh, talking to country A about country B and say country A is doing bad things to us, help us, country B overthrow them, throw them out. We see that kind of stuff. We see resistance movements, movements. we see armies being mobilized um, because even though the Europeans did their best to keep the technology and the military technology out of these countries, they're showing up every day with the technology with the weapons, with the industrial technology every day. So eventually it does sort of disseminate across the continent. And the money that is there, there's so much money poured into Africa that goes in the hands of most of these elites. It is eventually spread out to the population. We do see uh, some people rising to the top politi politically. We do see a few people getting an actual education, a real education, and they're able to speak out and vocalize rights of man and enlightenment and talk about the liberties and freedom. It's slow. Um, it's very slow, but we do see some people sort of pushing for these independence movements by the early mid 20th century, um, often using the language of the Enlightenment from 200 years earlier that the Europeans used, uh, using their own words against them. It's quite interesting. It's slow, though. And even when the independence does come, as you know, by the mid 20th century, most of them are independent. The devastating influence or the devastating effects, long term effects of this, uh, well, as I, as I said, it, much of it is still being felt in Africa today. Uh, you don't turn around 400 years of exploitation, oppression, uh, and slavery and murders and absolute destruction of your entire continent. You don't turn that around in a century, half a century. It takes a long time. It will be, yeah. If Africa ever truly recovers and is able to truly play on the world stage like Europe does, like Asia does, it, it'll be centuries probably. It'll be a long time. Um... As a result, um, the sort of this rise of this global inequality, uh, Europe versus the rest, and America could be included with that, Europe and America versus the rest. Uh, this gap opens up between the industrialized world and non-industrialized world. These, well, we, at the time, we called them third world nations. Today, we refer to them as, um, as, in, as, uh, as developing countries. Um, these third world nations versus the first world, which was, again, primarily Europe and the U.S., uh, Australia. Um, uh, really, I guess North America, Canada, of course, included. Um, and we see this, um, these uh, developing nations, primarily in Africa, Asia, Latin America. By 1750, the standard of living in most of the world was similar. In 1750, the standard of living was generally the same worldwide. Yeah, Europe probably had a bit of an advantage, but it wasn't much different. Again, as I said before, Kings and queens, emperors and rulers, whether it's India, China, Africa, America, Europe, in the 1600s, your average life of a regular person, the peasant, was still the same. Whether you were a poor farmer in China, Africa, Asia, America, Latin America, it wasn't much different, honestly, if you were just a typical peasant farmer. It really wasn't that much different. Um... By 1914, Europe was probably five times greater uh, as far as standard of living, economically, standard of living. We're just talking about money here, really. And England and the U.S. was ten times greater than any other place in the world. Global inequality. Most observers tie these income disparities between the two regions primarily to technological improvements and capitalism. Unrestricted capitalism, unrestricted capitalistic growth of the economies, and of course the technology, they went hand in hand with that. Um, each one building off of the other. Money fueling the tech, and new technologies allowing opportunities to make more money. And so back and forth, back and forth. Um, some others point to the idea of Western nations' use of force, of course, military force. That's one of the ways they kept a lot of these countries under control and kept them down um, to dominate and exploit the rest of the world. Really, I look at it as two sides of the same coin. It's all combined. It's all tied together. Um, all these things, really. And it does create a total disparity between Europe, or we might say the West and the rest. The West being Europe and, the, and North America and the rest. 
Um, yeah. And it's entirely unreasonable and unfair because the rest is like the other 80% of the population of the world, uh, mostly non-Christian, non-white. Um, but who comes to dominate the world with five and ten times more economic opportunity becomes the West. Worldwide per capita incomes. 1750, not much different. It's different, but not much. Well, 100 versus 200, so maybe double if that. By 1914, a little over 100, it's increased slightly, and Europe would be equal to, or developed countries, industrialized countries, equal to, what, uh, close to 1,000? So almost 10 times greater. We're looking at average income per capita, that means per person. So average income per person. Now, that still isn't 100% clear because we know that the wealth is often situated in the hands of the very rich. Um, so even in a place like America, like we have today, like half of our entire wealth in this country, the top 1% own. Half of all wealth in the United States is owned by 1% of the population. So it really throws off the averages. That's today. 1914, it wasn't like that. Yes, there was still a handful of really rich people, but the majority of the wealth in 1914 was still actually in the hands of most Americans. The real huge change happens after World War II, when you really start seeing this, the us moving here and the richest moving, you know, off the camera, gone. Anyway, thank you for going through all this with me. That's pretty much the end. Um, some interesting stuff in here, and I eh, hope you learned something. We'll see you next time.